move on to Brittany's question next. It says, we talk a lot about investing before retirement. How should investing look after retirement? Should I rebalance my portfolio, adding in more bonds or stick with index funds? Any tips or tricks as I start to think about this? Yeah, it, it is interesting. And we get we get those comments a lot that, man, it seems like there's so much emphasis. There's so much conversation around accumulation, around building the portfolio, around how to save, about army of dollar bills and all this stuff. So then what happens when I begin living off of these assets? Well, I think there is a common uh, misnomer out there that, okay, while I'm in my accumulation phase, while I'm building, I need to have risk. I need to have risk assets in my portfolio. I need to have equities. I need to have stocks. I need to make sure that I'm focusing on risk and growth. But then magically, when I retire, all of a sudden, all the risk goes away. And I'm going to take all of my retirement assets. I'm going to take all of my investment assets. I'm going to put them in a coffee can in the backyard. I'm just going to hold them in some cash account. Well, that's flawed thinking because one of the reasons that we tell you that risk assets can be advantageous is because they can grow over the long term. Well, even if you are only one, three, five years away from retirement, I'm going to argue that based on your life expectancy, some portion of your portfolio probably still needs to pay for life that is 20, 25, 30, maybe even 40 years in the future. So just because you are retired does not mean that the risk component or the risk aspect of your portfolio goes away. Just like you had 40 year money goals at age 20, I would argue even at age 60, you should have some 40 year money goals that your portfolio is set up to try to satisfy. So when it comes to retirement or when it comes to decumulation or when it comes to living off of those assets, it's not about this seismic shift that I go from risk on to risk off, but realistically, it's probably more about the glide path. How do I begin making some adjustments and making some changes as I move into the decumulation, as I move into the retirement phase? Brian, one of the things that you and I talk all the time about when we talk to pre-retirees, and one of the biggest ways that we see overall like allocation shift is in terms of even just something as simple as cash on hand. Like we oh, yeah. talk about emergency funds in the accumulation phase should be like three to six months. That shifts as you begin to approach and move towards your time. Yeah, you're hitting on, I wrote down three quick things and the, and the third one is exactly what you're hitting on is that there is a glide path that all of us are on. And and I think when, you know, when you're in the accumulation, I, and I also wrote down there's get wealthy behaviors and then there's stay wealthy behaviors. And, and look, while you're younger and you have decades to retirement, without a doubt, you're going to, to, to push the accelerator to try to grow your assets and maximize the opportunity. You'll see that in your cash reserves, which will probably be around three to six mm -hmm. months. You'll see it in your asset allocation where you're going to be you know, way heavy on the, the risk profile of uh, equity holdings and the S&P 500 and index funds. But then once you get successful... Um, you do start de-risking. And you're like, well, why? Because it's, it, it is that transition from get wealthy to stay wealthy. There is a true risk of running up the scoreboard once you're successful, is that once you figure out what do you need from your assets to, to live a comfortable retirement, you have to balance. Okay, does this mean that uh, – undercut the opportunity, meaning I, I, I think a lot of people think, and I've even had prospects who reach out and say, okay, when I get to be 60 years old or 65, I plan on going from 100% equities, I'm just going to go 100% bonds or cash. I'd argue that's pretty and, risky. And that's I'm not like, de risky. I'm like, that's, that seem ex seems extreme. But then on the other side of it, there are people who just want to run up the scoreboard by taking as much risk as possible to take advantage of the S&P 500, because like historically, it, it's going to get me you know, 10, 11% because that's what it's done for the last 50 years. What could go wrong? And I always remind people, you do not know how crazy your emotions will feel once you leave the workforce mm -hmm. completely. Is that it is a a strange transition to be go from accumulator and builder of wealth to now consumer of your wealth. And then also you take out your your working because a lot I think there's a coping mechanism for most of us is that when the market gets beat up and has that two out of every decade, two years out of every decade where the market goes into bear market territory and can lose 20%, 30%, 40, 50% like 2008. Um, and you're just like, oh, that's okay. I'll just work a little longer and I'll be able to get my money back. Well, when you've already retired, 
Um, I want you to think about the fact of what happens if you lost 40% of your assets while you actually retired like last year or two years ago. It's going to re- just completely create chaos in your brain. So that, I always tell people you need to have a glide path. You need to have a plan that reflects on all those things because it, you'll not only change the way you look at cash, like in retirement, it's un- you go from three to six months to 18 to 36 mm-hmm. months. You go from an asset allocation that still has equities in it so you can grow and, and build the legacy and the long-term opportunity for your assets, but you might also have enough diversified stuff in bonds, um, cash, and other conservative assets that you could conceivably ride out mm-hmm. anything that comes your way for years. I mean, because you will have access to very conservative assets that no matter what happens in the world. And, and then also, don't forget, we talk about risk tolerance and then we talk about risk capacity. Just because you're a cowboy or a cowgirl and you have the risk tolerance to, to, to get on any bucking bronco out there doesn't mean that you actually have the time to recover. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that is a big part of this as well. So we, we try to give every prospect, every client, and everybody we, we try to teach you on how to do this for yourself is that to recognize that there is a, a balance between how do we maximize opportunities but also minimize risk, and it's risk-adjusted, that's where the win is, and that's what you should be working to understand. Because you know, it's all back to the. And, and I know that I, after I did a little research, because I was like, I've been saying this my whole life: is pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, there, I know there's another way to say it: pigs get fed, hogs get. I can't no, even remember. Pigs but, get fat is the way you say it. Yeah, I know, but that, but it is, it's, it's back it's to the, the thing of. It. You can have too much of a good thing. Make sure you, you you balance between the fear of losing and the greed of trying to get as much as you can. Um, there's a healthy balance in there, and that's why typically when people are successful, this is a, one of the big things that that I think a good financial advisor can can help somebody out with is because your life when you get successful just naturally gets really complex. And it's nice to have somebody who's not just done what you one retirement because that's what you're facing you've done this one time why not have somebody who's done this hundreds of times so that they can tell you what to expect where your blind spots and how to get the best version of, of, of everything you're looking for